Chapter 14. So Yechezkel, last chapter, dealt with the various layers of false prophets, or true prophets who've gone bad. We'll see a little bit more of that theme, true prophets going bad in this chapter. We're also going to have uh, this very harsh talking to, for the people who actually come to Yechezkel here, that Yechezkel kind of qualifies that just because you're coming to talk to me doesn't mean that you're necessarily in God's graces if what you're doing behind closed doors is not particularly appropriate. And then we're going to get into this interesting conversation, this more global Yechezkel conversation that we've alluded to here, we've talked about at the Shabbat Shubh a while back, about Yechezkel's view on how people get paid back for their crimes, for their sins, etc., uh, that each person kind of stands alone, and they're judged for what they've done, not for what anybody else has done, and they have to answer for their actions, nobody else. So we'll see a little bit of that theme coming through in his description of this chapter as well. There's also be one interesting piece where we talk about uh, these three figures, and we'll try to discuss why those three figures in particular get mentioned, who those three figures maybe are, and we'll get there as well. So, Pasuk Aleph, Vayavo Eli Anashim, Mizik Nei Yisrael, Vayeshavu Lefanai. So, the elders are back. This time it's elders of Yisrael. The last time we saw elders coming, it was actually elders of Yehuda. So, it's a little bit unclear exactly who these people are. If they somehow managed to leave Israel. It doesn't seem like he's talking to the Jews in Israel. But still, these elders of Israel approach him. Vayihi devar Hashem Eli lemor, and the word of God came to me saying, Ben Adam, anashim ha'ela ha'elu gilulehem al-libam. They come to you with their idols on their hearts. Mechshel avonam nitnatnu nochach p'neihem. And basically, they, their stumbling blocks are right in their faces. So shall I respond to their inquiry? Right? If if someone comes to a prophet, so on the one hand, they seem to be searching out for God. On the other hand, they bring all the baggage that they're doing in the, behind their closed doors. So the God's almost asking the question, do I respond? How do I respond to these people? And we're going to actually see there's a debate between the Radak and Rashi in terms of how this whole conversation goes down. Um, that's very important, uh, very different in terms of how exactly we uh, we, we, we view these people. <laughs> so any man who has these idol, idols on their heart and these stumbling blocks in front of their face, and they come to the Prophet, Ani Hashem Right, so I'm gonna respond to him, although he came with all of these idols. So in order to, to basically take back the Jewish people f- from these idols that are in their hearts, right? So because they have cause other people, right, other Jews, to stray away from from me. Lachain emor el beis Yisrael kol marshem elokim shuvu vahashivu me'al gilulechem u'me'al kol to avosechem heshivu panechem. And this is actually a rare occurrence in Sefer Yechezkel. I've noted he very rarely tells people to do tshuva. This is one of the few places where he says, please do tshuva. Therefore say to the, these people, right, so come back from your Sins with these idols. Ki ish ish mi beis Yisrael me ager asher agar beis Yisrael vi nazer meacharai vayal gilulav elibo mechshalav ano yasiach nochach panav uvayal anavi lejosh lo bi ani Hashem na anel lo bi. Right. So because this person, I'm going to answer. How so? Vnasati panai be ish hahu vhashimo sihu la os vilim shalim vihich. 
Right? So he says, How am I going to answer them? Well, I'm going to direct my anger against them, and I'm going to make them desolate, and I'll make them the, the butt of every joke, um, and I'll cut them off from my midst, and then you'll know that I'm the Lord. So here's the debate between Radak and Rashi. The debate is, is so the Radak says, well, it sounds like they're going to come, and God's going to answer them. What does it mean, answer them? Oh, he's going to give it to them, right? For all of their idolatry and all of their causing the Jews to go off, and follow these these gilulim, these these idolatrous practices, they're going to get an answer from me, in the form of a fist, right? That's the answer they're going to get. Um, Rashi, so the kind of there's a little bit repetitive this whole section. So Rashi reads into this pasuk right here. He says, if after going to the prophet and getting the advice, they go back to doing their idolatrous practices, then this is what's going to happen to them. And that's going to be the lesson for everybody, right? And that's a huge difference, right? Adding that layer of, right, so there was an opportunity for them to, after speaking to the prophet, to in fact reform their ways and get on the straight and narrow. That's great and wonderful. Radak says no, right? They needed to do that already. The fact that they're coming to the prophet but still harboring all of these beliefs and doing all these things, right, that, that for Yechezkel, in his face, he basically can see it right there, so there, it, it, that's not that's not the appropriate way to to ask a navi, a prophet, for help. That's just it's, it's like divination. It's like another form of divination. Oh, we have our diviners that tell us through some other black magic, and now we go to our prophet friend to right help us figure out the future. But that's not the service of God. That's just right kind of continuing in the same old path. So the the way that you read that is it someone who's legitimately coming with the right intentions, even though they're bogged down by some of their previous actions, or no? Is this someone who really is doesn't really get it, and the only way is going to be the, the the hard love or the tough love or the seemingly no love, right? That God provides them in order to shake them up and shake them out of their slumber. So it's an important distinction. How do you read that? Yeah. If we. Which one? The, we have um, we have ba of ba. Then the kriya is bo. The kriya, well, ba. Oh yeah, yeah. ba, yeah, ba, ba, right. Right. What With an is, olive. Right. So what is what are we saying by reading a by reading a in a different way than? So, I think I don't think it changes the meaning too much. But the the ba would really better be read ba berov kilav, as opposed to meaning the where that word is attached would change whether it's the kriyaktiv. The trup goes with the ktiv, right? When eti lo, lo ba right. connects lo to ba, right? So I'm going to answer him with this, so that makes more sense. If it was ba with an aleph, it should be. Who came with all of his gilulim? Yeah, we do read it as the sweet. In other words, we read it. We read it as the as the Cree. We read it as the okay. So that's sorry, not the Cree, as the ksiv. So we right. So we do read it as it's written. Yeah. So. I don't know what it, I don't know I don't I don't know in this case if what it changes. Does it change? Does that, that's I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So sometimes sometimes the creative is a really important right? right? There are some people who have whole they, they build whole shiurim on I mean this this laning, this uh haftorah that we had. It's like the first like three psikim had like six or seven of them of a Cree and Xiv. Like there was like a half the words were in parentheses. Um so sometimes 
people will build whole ideas about the, the tension between the create and the active and how they cut in different directions, but they both have an element of truth to them. Um, this one, I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so jumping back to Pasuk Tet. So this Pasuk Tet is, is a little bit kind of where we saw the, some of the scholars in the previous parak reading that some of the prophets that seem to be false prophets maybe were true prophets who kind of went bad. So here we have another example of what seems to be true prophets seemingly going bad. The Pasuk Tet. V'hanavi ki puteh b'diber davar ani Hashem piteti et hanavi ahu v'natiti et yadi alav v'hishmaritiv mituch ami Yisrael. And so this, this actually Pasuk does two things that we've already seen a little bit of. So the first is it's called a prophet and he is seduced. So that sounds like he wasn't in the camp of false prophets but he was in the real camp of prophets, and then he was seduced away from that real prophecy. So at that point, right, God will basically destroy him if he goes down that path. So Rashi has a long conversation here about if someone in fact is starting to go down a certain path, God doesn't prevent them from going down that path. And if anything, if God sees that that person really wants to go down a certain path, he opens the door and lets him go down that path. So to some extent, right, the Navi did something that indicated to God that they were enticed to go down this path. So God says, here's your opportunity. And if he, in fact, does go down that path, he gets destroyed for it. So it's a little bit of a, a little bit of entrapment, but based off of, right, it's not, it, it, the entrapment doesn't come first. It comes post. It's a part of the punishment almost for the entire um, inclination in the first place. But the second thing we see in this Pasuk that we've seen before as well is that whenever the leaders are called out, even though, right, in this chapter he's talking to some of the leaders in particular, but still, right, even when he talks about this, this prophet who's being, causing Jews to potentially, right, go off with whatever he's saying, right, he still calls me Toch Ami Israel, right? It's still my nation Israel because when the leaders are called out, the followers, the people, are viewed as the, the victims of terrible leadership as opposed to the, the perpetrators of their own uh, fate and going, going down their own rabbit holes and their own sets of sins that have caused what's getting to them. So the... Right, so they will bear their their um, their sins, like the sins of the prophets. So basically, these two groups of people that we've talked about, the, these prophets who entice, or who go down that 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 road of enticement towards false prophecy, as well as these elders who come to me with their gilim on their faces and in their hearts. So. Those, the both, these and those, they're going to get their answers directly. And again, this is a very much in line with Yechezkel's whole idea of crime and punishment, of, of, of reward and, for, and punishment, basically, that if you do something wrong, right, you are going to get your punishment for it. It's not going to affect anybody else, and we're gonna, it's going to continue throughout this entire chapter. Yeah. So... Prophecy is really a transmission of what God tells you, right? Yeah. So there can be two kinds of false prophets, right? There can be the kind that, oh, you know, I'm a prophet, so... Make something up? Make something up. Right. Or someone who distorts. Or someone who, who, who gets the wrong message. Uh, so, so, so the wrong message, I don't... I mean, I don't think it's someone who's misinterpreting their prophecy, right? Because we've talked a lot about how prophets themselves don't always fully know what exactly the end game of their prophecy is, right? Yonah is the great example of, right, Odebram Yom Ninvinat Paches, it's going to turn over, so he was convinced that means destroyed, but really what it meant was they're going to all do tshuva. So that's an example of a prophet misreading his own, pro- his own words, like he's literally saying the words and he doesn't even know what his words mean. So we have also plenty of examples of prophets who turn to some angelic being for explanation, like, I'm not sure what I just saw. 
help. Right? Zachariah has that a couple of times when he sees different things, of the, different images of the menorah. He's like, I don't know what I just saw. And he has a whole conversation with an, with a, with an angel to help him. But the one with the two wings and the two feet. And the, so that was, we saw, that was, I think, Isaiah. Isaiah right? Yeah. So Yechezkel has his description of the, of the, the Srafim. But, right, so we have these examples of prophets seeing things and not fully understanding. I don't know that ever those people are called false prophets. They themselves sometimes are afraid of being construed as false prophets. Right? So one of the interesting things about Yonah is that Yonah has, according to some of Farshim, has this feeling that he's worried that people are going to perceive him as a false prophet because I said it's going to get destroyed and it didn't get destroyed. Even though that's not how you create a false prophet because people can do tshuva, there's always that room for repentance. Nevertheless, Yonah felt that if he said this and didn't happen, what are they going to say about me? I don't think that the misinterpreting if you do your best to try to interpret your prophecy. But let's say you get a prophecy that's a little bit vague. Right. And you stand to gain if this is what the prophecy means. And you decide to go down that path of explanation for what your prophecy is. So that might be kifate, right? That, that you get seduced, right? To go down a false prophecy lane. So, so who is the prophet? Uh, what was his name? Hanania? Yeah, but okay, but okay, so what category do we think he falls into? Um, it sounds like he was a guy who made stuff up. Okay. But he was very eloquent in his making stuff up. And at one time he was a true prophet, right? And Potentially. Then, and then he, for whatever reason. Yeah. He's betting. Who's betting on? Who's betting on the house? He had something to gain, and he said he had something to gain from being from being right. That Jeremiah would be wrong, and that he might be eloquent. Yeah. So he maybe saw something and interpreted it to his own. No, cer- certainly he was in the much better graces of the leadership. Right. Right. The kings really liked his his view of the world. They didn't really like. Right, it's kind of like the right the the, the the bears and the bulls in the stock. No one likes the bears. Like who likes the bears? No one likes short the bears. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The short sellers. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> the right. bottom yeah, feeders yeah. of the society yeah, of the. Yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly. Okie dokie. So. So Yud Aleph Lemaan Lo Yisu Od Beis Yisrael Meacharai Velo Yit Amu Od Bechop Sheehem Vayuli Laam Vaniye Yelahem Lelokim Neum Hashem Lelokim. So this is kind of a, a little bit of a a respite from a lot of pretty bad stuff that we've had, right? Just even, even in the midst of it all, and this again is because from the perspective of well, they're being led by these terrible people, we can't hold it all against them. So right. I want to get rid of these leaders, this leadership so that right, the Jewish people cannot be strayed and they can be my people like they've always been. Plus a good base. So I hit the Hashem more, and now we have a little bit of a shift. Ben Adam, Eretz, Ki Sechata, Sechata, Li, Le Ma'al, Ma'al, Vinititi, Yadi, Aleha, Vishivariti, La, Mate, Lachem, Vishlach, Tiba, Ra'a, Vichrati, Mimena, Adam, Obeyma. So this um, actually is, uh, is jumping back to some of our earlier themes that we saw. So we saw that some of the things that are going to happen include famine, include some of the other things that we're going to see in this, in, this, in this chapter. But it's also interesting. It happens a couple of times in Yechezkel. Um, I haven't really come up with a really good explanation for it, but there's a really interesting conversation where he talks to things like the land here, right? That the, the land will sin, right? So... At that point, there's going to be a famine, but it's really—it's not the land that's sinning. It's not like the creation story when the tree makes a, a tree that doesn't itself is not a fruit, does bears fruit. So the right the in theory the, the the land sinned. This is not the land sinning. This is the people of the land sinning, but it's directed against the land, um, and the result is is a famine. Right, that God's going to break the staff of the bread. Um, 
and it's going to affect both man and animal. And this is where it gets particularly interesting for us. There will be three people amongst, right, while this is happening, who basically are, in to some extent, untouchable. So this is the flip opposite of, right, people who sin get punished. These are the, the people who are righteous, right, will be saved. Right, Noach, Daniel, Viyov, Hema Betid Kasam, Yinat Slu, Nafsham, Neum Hashem. So, right, so these are the people who are saved in the midst of, right, all these things. So, fascinating. Uh, these are the three that are mentioned. So, first of all. A sense of, I thought, the eagle was much before the time of the. So, who? So Daniel is, it would be a younger person who could have been a contemporary, but, but much younger. He certainly would not, most likely not have the, um, the name recognition and fame at this point that we'd expect. Meaning we, don't, we wouldn't expect him to be on this list, Daniel. Um, it's interesting, the, there's a, the, a lot of the modern scholars say that Daniel here is spelled without a Yud, so maybe it's not Daniel, but it's actually a fellow named Danel, uh, who was a mythical hero situation. He was apparently an idolater, um, not, a, not a Jewish person, but neither of the other two are Jewish, so that's the interesting piece. Noah and Eov are both not Jewish. So the part of the, part of the inclination to make Danel, Daniel, or Danel in this case, Right, not Jewish, is to make him fit with the other two. And the truth is, the Gemara says Eov may have never existed either. He's just the every man of sorrow, right? So, if Eov never existed, then it's not so much of a jump to say they're talking about some other mythical figure who was some hero. At the same time, Eov was a good guy. Um, Danel was an idolater, so it's kind of ironic to have the first half of this chapter talking about all the elders coming to Ezekiel with the idolatry in their hearts, and then to say, oh, there's going to be a famine, but don't worry, this guy, right, Danel, because of his general righteousness, is going to be okay despite his idolatry. So there's, those are the two options. Um, the Tanchuma, the Midrashim, so they highlight another point, which I think is very compelling also. Um, which is that Noah, Daniel, and Eov are basically the world, nation, and uh, personal views of three worlds. They saw the, the original world, so to speak. They saw the destroyed world, and they saw the post-destroyed world. So when it comes to Noah, it's much very simple, right? Noah saw the literal world pre-flood, he experienced the flood and then had to rebuild the world post flood. Daniel, so it's interesting, there's there's two right, so Daniel may have seen the first temple being destroyed. If he's a contemporary, a younger contemporary, he saw the, the first temple being destroyed. Then he survives all the way to the rebuilding of the second temple, and he sees the hole in between. So he sees on a national level the destruction, the in between and then the rebuilding. And on the last level, you have Eov, who has his family, right, which is this beautiful family. The family gets utterly destroyed, and then he has to basically pick up the pieces at the end. And how these three people are righteous individuals who live amongst the destruction and are saved only for their righteousness. Um, we're going to see Yechezkel overplays his hand a little bit. right? He says, these people live, their families don't live, nobody lives, right? Which is not really true about Noah. But um, so there's conversations about that possibility being because God needed the world to continue, so he gave certain dispensation to the family of Noah so that the world could continue despite the fact they may not have deserved to survive. Um, but this is just a, a really interesting set of people that Yechezkel is bringing up as he's talking to the Jews about you get punished for things that you do and you right, live out for things that you do well.
that Noah would have been Meshem Makon would have been a nothing during the time of Abraham. Uh, and he brings this Pusik. That the Yechezkel is using him. Right. As a person who would have survived. He's, he's, he's right. using him right. Interesting. I can't remember who it is. You could just say, though, that that generation wasn't a very good generation either. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you right. right. I just thought it was anyway. It's saying this that reminded right. me of. Interesting. As, as saying, as, as that's very interesting. Um, also, it's also very interesting. I mean, we don't we don't have quotations of other people so often, um, in, in especially in prophets like Ezekiel, Isaiah. They don't they don't you know, Jeremiah. They don't really quote too many other biblical stories too often. So it's always interesting to see them see them coming out. But yeah. Mark's point is, is well taken. Daniel would be significantly younger than Yechezkel at this point. So unless he's known as some young whippersnapper and up and coming, um, it's it's interesting that he would be a choice. Um, also, he certainly hasn't experienced all those things, the the three the three levels. He hasn't exp- he hasn't even experienced the destruction yet. <laughs> so I just sort of felt it was like kind of like a a time warp thing. Uh, yeah, word for it's a. Uh, Right, I mean, the truth is, Eov, we don't really know when Eov, that, like, that's part of the Gemara's challenge with Eov, is trying to figure out when Eov lived. And the, basically, the, the options are almost any period of time, as early back as the Jews in Egypt, right? And, or he never existed. And he's really just a, a, a metaphor, so to speak. He's not a real, real human being. Um, he's just trying to help us understand what suffering looks like. Fine. So. So not only will there be a famine, but now there will be wild beasts running around, causing the the, world, the basically the land to be completely desolate, and people can't really live there. Yet, these three would be still living through it. If they would have sons and daughters, they alone would be saved, meaning the three would be saved, but their kids would not. The land would be desolate. Oh, Cherev. This is another one of the ones that we saw. The animals is added. We haven't seen the animals previously. We saw famine, and we've seen the sword. Oh, Cherev. Avi al aretz hahiv amarti Cherev to avor ba'aretz yichrati mimena adam u'beimah. A sword will run through the land, destroying all men and beasts. Right? So when the sword comes through, these three would survive, but their sons and their daughters would not survive unless they were worthy. O Dever, and this is the third that we've seen in a lot of the contexts, pestilence, ashalach, el ha'aretz, ha'hi v'shafachti chamasi aleha, so the pestilence would come and again would utterly destroy, go up and down the countryside. Right, if they have children, only in their righteousness would they themselves be saved, but not for the sake of their fathers. Af ki arbaat shifatai haraim cherev raav chaya raav adever vishilach the yushalayim laachris vimana adam v'ema. Right, and this is kind of part of the irony. I don't remember where I saw this, but someone pointed out. Right, you have three righteous individuals, and you have four things coming to destroy. Right, the the, the notion of of where the direction, right, of where the Jewish people in Israel are particularly going is towards this destruction. And this is a very strange. Well, I don't think I don't think anyone was expecting this, right? So after so just saying that there's going to be these four different rampages up and down the country, and the only ones who are going to survive are the righteous individuals who deserve so for their own sake, now all of a sudden there sounds like there are, and maybe these people are 
the Noahs, Daniels, and Eobs of the world, but it's not clear that that's true, right? It doesn't sound that way. It sounds there's going to be a couple of stragglers, a couple of escapees who are going to make it your, their, your way, and then you'll understand, right, what happened, and you'll be comforted over, right, that they'll tell you about all the evils that existed in your Shalayim and why everyone deserved what they got, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and you'll have a little bit more clarity and feeling of comfort that you get it, right? It makes sense. The system makes sense, so to speak. But at the same time, it's a little bit ironic that these people are surviving, right? If, if they're righteous individuals, then, okay, that's one thing, but it, it sounds like they're suffering terribly, which, by the way, right, Noah, Eov, in particular, right, then this is another reason that Daniel doesn't fully fit, they suffer a lot, right? Job does not have an easy life, and Noah does not have an easy life either. Both of them struggle mightily with the, the survivor guilt or whatnot, and, and how could this have happened? Those questions that haunt Eov. Noah escapes in vineyards. Like, that's not, it's not like they come out unscathed. They do survive. They are saved because of their righteousness, but... Well, it's like the discussion about Right. It makes us wonder about these people are coming out. Like, you may not be perfectly righteous, but compared to all the other right. other folks that were right, right. destroyed in Jerusalem during the destruction, you know, right? They Perhaps they they made it. They made the cut. Better, right? Right. right. They made the cut. They made God's cut because they served a purpose as well of conveying what took place to the people in exile. Right. He doesn't, he, he doesn't make it back. He doesn't get the next step. It's the right. next generation after him. Right. And though he is kind of like he's kind of like a mixture, I would say, between Moshe, I mean, Moshe in that way. But he's more like a Mordechai figure in terms of, right? He's a very oh, prestigious. Yeah. Right. He's a very prestigious role. Um, for a lot of his life, he's pretty young when he kind of gets into it, and yeah, he gets into some trouble, and has the whole den of lions situation. But like for the most part, he's uh he's viewed as a, one of these great scholars, great minds of his generation. That, yeah, so, uh, right, in that, right, and, but he doesn't, he doesn't get to go to Israel. Right. He doesn't get to go on the new, uh, right. yeah, no, yeah, no. So, Pazu Chav Gimel, V'nichamu eschem ki siru es darkam, so you'll, you'll be, feel better, because you'll see the path of the people who make it to you, V'es ali lotam, and all of their terrible things, probably they'll tell you. It's not exactly clear whether if they if these people are the people who are doing these terrible things, and it's even more of a head scratcher why they're the ones who are escaping. Um, but somehow there's going to be clarity when you see these escapees. It wasn't for nothing. It wasn't just stop. It didn't. Everything had a purpose and a reason. And when you see it, you'll understand. Right, and that's to a large extent, right, the, the system of justice that Yechezkel describes I think is summed up beautifully in that verse, right? You'll understand and appreciate that nothing happens just willy-nilly. There's a, there's a, a big plan going on here that every single person who's getting what they're getting deserves what they're getting, and every person who doesn't get that deserves to not get that. And that's an important, an important theme that runs through the entirety of the book. So we'll stop here, and we'll pick up with chapter 15.